your hair is not only on your head, but the hair on your head is essential for two important things, thermal regulation and sun protection. Yes, your parents were correct when they told you to wear a hat when it was cold when you went outside to make the snowman. Your head is, in fact, the chimney to your body. Someone without hair on their head will lose a buffer of thermal regulation. They also lose sun protection for the scalp without hair. There is an old saying, pity the bald man, but I wouldn't pity. I would give props to the bald man and, and or woman, the bald person, for battling the environment and living as their true selves. Your hair provides thermal regulation and sun protection, not only on your head, but also in the other areas of your body as well. You may not realize this, but your eyelashes are really important for sun protection for your eyes. But they also function as filters for your eyes, trapping large particles before they get in. I live on a dirt road, and all those roads that lead to my road are dirt roads. And we have very few plowable roads in my town. Keeps my taxes low. But when a car is in front of you on a dirt road, it's kicking up all the dirt in their wake, and you're driving in it. And I can usually feel the small dirt particles building up on my eyelashes um, while they're trying to like guard my eyes. I have a mosquito up here because your hair plays a really large part as a sensory organ for your skin. Every hair has its own dedicated free nerve ending. When an insect such as this mosquito disturbs your hairs, the sensation is sent to your brain as, and is interpreted as something is crawling on me. And now, if we were in an area around maybe the equator, that sensation might just save your life from a malaria-carrying mosquito. The hair on your head is called terminal hair whereas the hair on your body is called vellus hair. These hair types are structured similarly, but they're very different in terms of the depth to which they penetrate the cutaneous membrane and the length of the hair on the outside. I just wanna point out that something very subtle on this diagram, the very thin purple layer of the epidermis dips down to cover the entire hair that penetrates the skin. So it is almost as if your hair is, I mean, almost entirely external to your body, despite having its own free nerve ending and also having its own blood vessel. So, okay, so some facts. Your hair can grow about a centimeter per month, which means about one inch per two to three months. Now, at any given moment, the hairs on your head are not the hairs that were there yesterday because you are constantly shedding hairs to the rate of about 90 per day. That's a lot. I think that's a lot. This number just seems like a lot, but it also means that 90 new hairs are also developing on any given day. Uh, this number 90 depends on your overall health and it really depends on your diet. You can put all the keratin containing shampoos that you want into your hair, but if you want more of it or thicker of it or stronger of it, you have to start with your diet. Pregnant women do not shed their 90 hairs per day. The hormone progesterone pro contains a really high, I'm sorry, the hormone progesterone maintains a really high level for nine months. And while progesterone is high, hair does not shed. Weight is gained. And anything else that could help the baby is done. At the end of the nine months of the pregnancy, the progesterone levels drop precipitously. And all of the hairs that should have been shed over those nine months are then shed over the weeks throughout the delivery. Erector pili are the little muscles that are on each hair. And when these muscles contract, they pull the hair erect, which is the same mechanism at work when cats do this fluff cat kind of thing. 
I, I'm sorry, but side note, my cat, Matilda, has abnormally short tail and legs from being confined in a cage for the first 18 months of her life. I don't know, or maybe it's genetic. I don't know. But she she was scared of other kitty cats at the pound, um, so they put her in her own cage. And then when we brought her home, everything would scare her, and she would fluff. <laughs> and her stubby little tail, it would, it would just look so funny because it was so short. The stuff about my cat, though, it's, it, it's not important. But what is important is that these little muscles are smooth muscles, which means that they are involuntarily controlled. These erector pili, they also act together. One of them doesn't contract. All of them contract every time together. So even though each hair is controlled by a different free nerve ending, every single one of these nerves and hairs will coordinate erecting, erecting their hair all at the same time. This is what we call multi-unit smooth muscle control. There are many many different erector pili, multi-unit, all acting at the same time. When you are scared, you might say that you got goosebumps or that the hairs on your neck stood up. Same thing here. Both of these actions, goosebumps and hair standing up, they're the same thing. And they're all the result of your erector pili. There are many theories about why humans have retained the ability to do this, but that's the topic of worth more explanation in another class that I teach. Yeah, I don't, I don't really have much to say about nails <laughs> because I chew mine until they bleed and that's what anxiety does to me. I think the one thing that I would like to point out about nails is the lunule. It's that right there. This is the lighter shade of your nail that exists in a semicircle or crescent shape where the nail meets the skin. Lunules expand with malnourishment. And it's a really easy way to tell if a child is not getting the nutrition that they need, even adults. It can also be a really good indicator of Crohn's or celiac disease. These two diseases affect the small intestine's ability to absorb food and so food passing through someone's intestine with Crohn's or celiac, it passes through, but they don't get the nutrition out of it that they need. And speaking about disease indicators, nails change significantly with many autoimmune disorders. They become ridged and brittle in diseases such as psoriasis, which is a skin disease, um, but usually comes with hair, nail, and arthritic issues. Psoriasis can be accompanied most often by PSA or psoriatic arthritis. I have this. Sometimes I have sausage fingers and they're so swollen and painful that I can't type. And don't tell me to use talk to text. Have you ever tried it? It is so frustrating. The lunule is also the site of your nail bed. And this is the tissue that's capable of generating or growing the nail. Damage to the nail bed can result in the inability to grow a smooth or correctly shaped nail ever again. 